who is the first person? They're at the ocean, right? They see a crab, this gross, ten-legged crustacean scuttling along the beach sideways, and they thought to themselves, you know what? Let me rip off its claws, boil them, dump it in a stick of melted butter, and eat it. I bet that'll taste great. It's the same person who wants EIS in every electrochemistry paper. Welcome to the Electrochemistry Podcast, where we discuss all things electrochemistry. I'm your host, Dr. Alex Paroff, and with me is my co-host, Dr. Neil Spinner. On today's podcast, we are going to take a look at a strange EIS problem. Fourth-year graduate student Priyanka was happy. This is Priyanka's story. Priyanka, a fourth-year chemistry graduate student, was studying the hydrogen evolution reaction using primarily DC voltammetry techniques like cyclic voltammetry, linear sweep voltammetry, and chronoamperometry. Suddenly, she learned she was going to need to add EIS experiments and measurements to complete her next publication and eventually finish her PhD thesis. She cursed her luck that EIS has become so relevant in the field of electrochemistry because it is difficult and confusing. You know, I really think this is a more recent phenomenon, or at least like relatively recent, depending on well, what you consider recent, right? But, you know, without having done admittedly like a huge amount of case study on this specific thing here, my intuition is that, you know, some years ago, it was like perfectly acceptable to publish any electrochemistry paper with like just DC techniques like CV and LSV, like you said. But really, it seems like now more often than ever, reviewers are demanding EIS data to go along with it. Yeah, nowadays, almost every pretentious that needs to have EIS capabilities, not necessarily because the researcher needs it now, but for the times in the future where a reviewer or an editor is going to ask for it. Exactly. So just remember, folks, we make instruments for your specific electrochemistry research needs, not just because we want to get rich off your grant dollars. <laughs> and speaking of equipment, Priyanka set up her own potential stat and used a platinum disc working electrode with a wave vortex rotator in 0.1 molar sulfuric acid using a graphite rod counter electrode and a calomel reference electrode. She ran OCP and she got a stable potential indicating that all electrodes were in solution, but when running EIS, she saw all kinds of problems. Sometimes the potential stat collected a few data points, but they were all over the place. Her Nyquist plot either looked jagged and messy or like a scatter shot of dots with no discernible pattern at all. Other times she tried to run the test, but the software gave an error and simply said it failed the experiment. She tried playing a little with the different like EIS parameters, but to no avail. She simply could not figure out why EIS was not working like her other DC methods. Well, Neil, you, sir, are the resident EIS expert around here. I've got a couple ideas about like what's going on, but at first glance, do you have any thoughts about what could be causing the problem, or perhaps more specifically, what exactly is the problem? Impedance is the problem, my friend. I know we talked before about how many electrochemistry researchers are finding that, you know, the solution to getting more publications is to add EIS data. I'm here to tell you, as the EIS expert, that impedance is not the solution, it is the problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as a chemist, there was very little in the way of electrochemical training when I was an undergrad and even as a graduate student. And what I did get in training was all DC voltammetry techniques. AC voltammetry just isn't something chemists are commonly taught. And I mean, there's a lot of terminology and just stuff that we don't get. So if Priyanka is a chemist, you know, just a chemistry student studying the hydrogen evolution reaction, then maybe some of the issues that she's running into is just maybe not sufficient education on AC voltammetry or EIS in general. Yeah, I, I think that's definitely playing a role here. And I think to a large degree, EIS is, you know, it's not really being covered and, and taught, you know, in, 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 well, particularly undergrad, but even in graduate school. And, you know, but it, what's, what's weird to me is that like, EIS itself is not like a, a brand new technique. You know, it's not so like just brand new that nobody has been using it long enough to know how to teach it, which, you know, sometimes happens with like really, really new methods. Like EIS has been around for decades and there's even a few textbooks written specifically on electrochemical impedance spectroscopy, if you can believe it. So 
I just, you know, I just guess for whatever reason, it's, it took years for this method to be like, you know, more widely accepted in the community. Yeah. I, I know a thing or two about things gain, gain acceptance in the community. It's, it's like pineapple and anchovies on pizza. It took a while, but eventually they came to be accepted as condiments for pizza. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Who told you that you could put pineapple on a pizza? Anchovies? Fine. They're salty. Pizza is salty. It works great. Tastes delicious. But pineapple? What are you? Some kind of psychopath? <laughs> There's a lot you don't know about me. God, if the things that I don't know about you involve putting fruit on pizza, I think I'm happier not knowing. <laughs> okay, but first, like, have you tried it? Of course not. I'm not a lunatic. Okay, is it, is it the sweet versus salty, savory experience that you're worried about? Like, I, I'm going to get to the bottom of this. Yeah, I'm worried mm-hmm. about eating things that absolutely don't belong together under any circumstances like pizza and pineapple okay i know i know we've talked about this before but you know where there are these cases of just strange food combinations that just exist because of the circumstances but we now consider them normal like why would someone think putting tomato sauce and cheese on top of bread would be a good idea and in some countries i mean we're in the u.s but like they eat totally different things like they eat dogs or they'll eat snakes and we just arbitrarily decided like oh Let's eat chicken. You know, this actually brings me to another question I've had or just this random thought that's like, who is the first person, right? They're at the ocean, right? They see a crab, this gross, clawed, ten-legged crustacean scuttling along the beach sideways. And they thought to themselves, you know what? Let me rip off its claws, boil them, dump it in a stick of melted butter, and eat it. I bet that'll taste great. It's the same person who wants EIS in every electrochemistry paper. Ugh, what a jerk. I guess we don't have a choice then. We need to finish our crab dinner here and then get to the bottom of Priyanka's, you know, bad EIS data, don't we? <laughs> yeah, EIS is the crab dinner of dinners. So so if that if EIS is the crab dinner of dinners, then what would cyclic voltammetry be? Like, would it be the chicken dinner? But, you know, some people like crab dinner, right? <laughs> yeah, well, apparently people like me because most of my PhD and postdoc I did on EIS. But uh, I have a confession here. In reality... Uh, I'm actually allergic to crab and I can't even eat it. So I just feel lost. (laughs) So speaking of lost, how do we make sense of these scatter points in the Nyquist plot? Well, when it comes to nasty, crabby EIS data, (laughs) we have to use all the tools that we have in our like plotting tool belt, so to speak. So that means that we want to take a look at both the Nyquist and the Bodhi plots. Now, Before you mentioned that Priyanka's Nyquist plot, like it was noisy, it was scattered, it was all over the place, or sometimes, you know, the test just outright failed. Uh, But there's some more things that you can learn about your test if you're able to view both the Nyquist and the Bodhi plots together at the same time. So for those of you listening and who are not too familiar with EIS and those two types of plots, EIS usually consists of five columns of data. There's the frequency, there's the real impedance, sometimes called Z-real. There's the imaginary impedance, also called Z-imaginary. And then there's the magnitude of the impedance, Z-mag. And then, of course, there is the last part, the phase angle. So those are the five columns of EIS data. A Nyquist plot shows the negative imaginary impedance versus the real impedance. And a Bode plot shows the magnitude of the impedance and the phase angle versus the log of the frequency. So both Nyquist and Bode plots contain the same information, but are plotted differently. And as a result, some things might look okay in one's form, but not okay in the other. Yeah, exactly. So for example, with some of the tests that Priyanka you know, did and she looked at in her Bode and Nyquist plots, if she looked at like just the Bode plot, for example, she might have assumed everything was mostly okay. But looking at the Nyquist plot, it was clear that there was, you know, scatter and noise. Okay. So this can sometimes happen, for example, because Z magnitude is typically represented logarithmically on the Bode plot. And so what this means is that it might look smoother or hide small noise effects that might appear more obvious on the Nyquist plot. Now, remember the axes on the Nyquist plot, which as Alex just told you, it's Z real and Z imaginary, or sometimes minus Z imaginary, are actually like XY vectors of Z mag. And so what that means is that graphically, compared to like a perfect ideal system, both Z real and Z imaginary might change because of some noise or some issue. But what it means is that the vector sum Z mag might not change much. And so in some cases, it means that the Nyquist plot might be ugly, but the Bode plot, not so much. All Nyquist plots are ugly. 
because it's EIS data. And EIS is hard and confusing and ugly. But you know it's not ugly or confusing? CV data. And I have seen a lot of CV data. You know, as the resident so-called expert and official Pine Research cheerleader for EIS, I am reporting you to HR for disparaging my beloved technique. However, I suppose I should confess that, well, you're not wrong. And uh, as it relates to Priyanka's data, uh, I mean, on that note, can you tell me what her DC data looked like then? Yes. So she did OCP and cyclic voltammetry at relatively, well, she did cyclic voltammetry at relatively slow sweep rates. So this is between like 5 to 10 millivolts per second. Uh, this was under a non-rotating case, and the data looked fine. However, when Priyanka moves to faster sweep rates, like 200 to 500 millivolts per second, then we start to see a little bit of noise. Ah, uh, yeah. See, here's the key there, right? If you think about EIS data, like it's it's fast, right? You have, you have sine waves, you know, fast frequencies, something like that. You can think about a CV with a large sweep rate as like something that's approaching EIS experiment speed. So the points, you know, need to be acquired faster. The potential and the current are changing quicker. So it makes sense, for example, that if, if her EIS data isn't going well, that a relatively fast version of CV with like a fast sweep rate, like you said, would also present similar problems. This sounds like a partially an instrument and data acquisition issue. Do, do the scattered points in Priyanka's EIS data occur primarily in like the high frequency region? And do, do things look a bit better if they're in the low frequency region? So interestingly enough, most of her tests either failed before they got to the low frequencies or they just kind of looked pretty noisy throughout. Now, I think in theory, as we start to narrow down what the root cause is here, like your idea will start to make sense that, you know, good, good at low frequency, maybe bad at high frequency, right? You might expect, you know, the low frequency, the points might start to look decent. But the real issue here is that even if that were the case, you can't really get like a full and useful set of EIS data without going to at least, you know, somewhat moderately high frequency. So like we can't just probe from one hertz and lower and, you know, call it a day. Yeah, I just realized like this might be confusing to our listeners, but just to be clear, when we say high frequency, we're thinking or talking about something like one megahertz to 10 kilohertz. And then the moderate to mid frequency is one kilohertz to one hertz. And then one hertz to one millihertz would be like the low frequency. Yeah, yeah. Something like that's a pretty good overall distinction of, you know, frequencies in EIS. But, of, you know, of course, there's different experiment types and different systems, and, and there might be some exceptions to those limits. But of course, of course, there are exceptions. Like every time I learn something new and interesting in science, there's always an exception. Not just exceptions, but made up math and constants to make things work. See, for those listening who aren't aware, Alex comes from chemistry, but I come from chemical engineering. And so what I think sometimes people in chemistry don't know about like engineering disciplines is that we just make stuff up all the time so that math works. Exceptions be damned. Oh yeah. So when you're, when you're doing your like free EIS webinars, shameless plug, <laughs> you, you always get questions about what is the physical meaning of some of these constants? And frankly, it's just math. It's just a way to make math work. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the real dirty truth of EIS, circuit fitting, chemistry, electrochemistry, life, the universe, all of it, really. The truth is that nothing makes any real sense. And then, you know, we just add some factor like alpha or X or a smiley face or, you know, and we add an exponent and Arrhenius constant or whatever made up <laughs> thing. And then poof, it works. Look, I made science happen. You know, I was, I was, uh, I was speaking to one of my friends uh, who's, uh, who's in physics. Uh, and yes, I have friends in physics <laughs> who uh, they were talking to me about this science fiction book where the premise was that all the equations that we use in science are correct, but the constants were different. And then they described this like whole world and universe that's different because these constants are different. And then as a result, society was very, very different from what we experience. It, it was a pretty cool concept. And, um, I can tell you nothing else than just it was a cool concept. Wait, wait. Are you talking about the Matrix? Are you Keanu Reeves? C can you stop bullets and see the world through, like, green falling binary code? Yeah, that, that's like if pi was exactly equal to three, 
then the world will become the matrix oh man i saw an episode of the simpsons once where they had this room full of like you know stereotypical white coat scientists all talking you know they're not paying attention you know some conference or something like that and the character <laughs> professor frank he gets up in front of them and he just goes pi is exactly three that's all i can think of when you say that oh yeah yeah that's i think i saw that episode yeah that's where i got the idea that pi is exactly equal to three uh it was from that simpsons episode man i hope we're paying them royalties once again the simpsons thought of it first simpsons did it yeah well you know what the simpsons didn't do anything related to electrochemistry uh I, I think so i mean i guess i haven't seen every episode but i don't i don't recall seeing any electrochemistry simpsons content but then again i also don't have cable but you know what alex speaking of cable do you, do you know what i think actually is the problem with priyanka's eis data she doesn't watch the simpsons N no what well, well maybe but no what i mean is most probably her cell cable configuration that's probably what's causing most of the error in these EIS and, you know, like fast sweep CV measurements. So is this, <laughs> Neil, are you telling me this is one of those rare cases where the reference electrode isn't the problem? Oh, I feel so dirty letting reference electrodes off the hook. But yes, I do think in this specific case, this is a you know situation where the reference electrodes are going to get a temporary pardon. Okay. Okay. So. So, you know, I do a lot of DC voltammetry experiments, but why would it be that the cell cables are causing EIS-related issues, but the cell cable isn't really affecting the DC voltammetry techniques very much? Well, first of all, part of the story here is how Priyanka set up like her experiment, and it's just it's this crazy story involving configuration of instruments and computers and lab bench space and potentiostat carts. So, you know, to give you some more insight into the story here is that her lab mates, Priyanka's lab mates, they definitely don't spend nearly enough time cleaning and organizing their research lab. So like stuff is just all over the place. So what this means is the spot where Priyanka set up her wave vortex electrode rotator for her electrochemistry experiments was just nowhere near a computer and like the potentiostat that she's using was on one of those rolling carts in the middle of the aisle. <laughs> ah, yes, the the lab the lab has become the dim sum restaurant. I think I'll take uh, the potentiostat a la carte uh, with a flask of those random NMR tubes. Oh, <laughs> is that the uh, is that the blue tape? Oh no, do do you have the, any of the yellow lab tape? Oh, it's in the back. Okay, I'll wait. I'll wait. Thank you. Yeah, I think if I ever went to a real dim sum restaurant that was like as just disorganized as Priyanka's lab, I'd immediately call the health inspector. I mean, seriously, like, you know, you can print like a paper menu to show all the things you have. They don't have to be left out constantly everywhere. It's such a mess. Oh, the dim sum is so good, and and you just you just look at the food and you'll say like, oh, I'll take that, and then boom, it's on your table, and you're eating that. But, but all that said, there's a, there's a difference between good and bad dim sum, just like there's a difference between organized and disorganized labs or messy labs. And I'm guessing in this case, all these cables from the laptop, the potential stat, any other instruments that were on the cart might be affecting the EIS data. Yeah, exactly. Like just as you wouldn't want to eat, you know, in a bad, dirty dim sum restaurant, so too. You would not want to get electrochemical data from a messy, disorganized lab like this. So the fact that the computer, the rotator, the potentiostat, they're all like far away from each other. What it means is that, you know, Priyanka had to use these extra long cables in particular going from like the potentiostat cell cable to the rotator. Wait, how long are these cables? Well, I mean, she had like the standard potentiostat cell cable, right, that comes away from the instrument itself. And then like one or two extra banana cable wire lengths and then you know into the rotator i mean it was like one and a half rattlesnakes worth of cable length going on <laughs> one and a half rat what kind of unit is that are we so averse to like <laughs> the metric <laughs> system a metric or imperial units this is america my friend there is no limit to the lengths that we will go to to avoid using the metric system did you know that the average adult weighs about as much as one eighth of a birch tree <laughs> Or approximately <laughs> 95 and a third squirrels. <laughs> okay, so what is that in kilograms? Kilo what now? Oh, man. You know, like every news report always describes things as just like, it was the size of a washing machine or a refrigerator. Or this giant rock is the size of a tennis court. Oh, man. I actually saw this news report once that described like a meteor that had landed somewhere in like the state of Texas as having the weight of seven kegs of beer. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But, you know, okay, so for some reason... Like, there's no problem describing, like, the wind speed as just, like, miles per hour or temperature in Fahrenheit. So I'm, I'm sorry for everyone who, who uses, like, kilometers per hour or Celsius. But, like, when, when we actually do use real units, 
they're silly imperial ones. They're not even metric ones. Uh, you know, you know, mutants that actually make sense. Yeah, I mean, really, it's it's such a shame. So anyway, as I was saying, this rattlesnake of cables <laughs> is is most certainly. Well, anyway, this these these cables that Priyanka is using, right? They're most certainly causing the problems with her impedance data. And you know, the reason is mainly that like every time you add a connection or another point, right, between the potentiostat and the electrochemical system or your electrode, right? You introduce more impedance and more places where the signal can pick up noise and interference. So this is also because, you know, potentiostat cell cables are usually shielded against noise and interference like this, but the extra cabling that she's using is not shielded. So you know, her tests were just like ultra susceptible to noise. Yeah, so so people might not realize this, but your your potential that cell cables sometimes they have this extra thick shielding bunching all of the leads together until the very end, where they then like then all the cable leads just like spread out like you know the the alien tentacles from like Independence Day. So so this is to shield the cables as much as possible before they actually interact with the electrochemical cell. Wait a second. Did you just reference late 1990s Will Smith blockbuster movie Independence Day? Or did I reference garbage 2016 sequel Independence Day Resurgence? <laughs> I hope it's the first one because, you know, honestly, in retrospect, Independence Day, like, I think that movie's kind of dumb, but like, I just had some major nostalgia going on right now when you just mentioned it. Oh man, that scene when the alien tentacle thing, it's like mind controlling that guy who played Data from Star Trek, and then he's making him tell the army dudes that they, you know, they plan to take over Earth. Oh, so scary and so good and also so very stupid. Yeah, release me. <laughs> Release me. Oh God, it's so <laughs> creepy. I know he says that too. And then they like, and then the army guys, they like, sorry, spoiler alert, everybody, but it's, well, the movie's like 20 years old or something at this point, but they shoot through the glass, right? They kill the alien and they finally put an end to the super long tentacle cables. Okay. So this is why they had to kill the alien. His mind control was not effective because his tentacle cables were way too long and not shielded properly. This is why the mind-controlled guy, scientist guy, he could barely speak at all. So, so we know now that aliens communicate using high to mid-frequency sine waves, probably 10 millivolt amplitude. Yeah, exactly. We just solved alien EIS. Coincidentally, this is also the topic of my next free webinar. Welcome to electrochemistry. See, you never knew all of these late 1990s blockbuster movies had so much electrochemistry in them, but that's why we're here, to educate the public on these important matters. <laughs> so, Neil, does, does this mean if the alien had shorter tentacle mind control cell cables <laughs> and <laughs> didn't have that exoskeleton, which adds another point of interference, the scientist guy would have communicated more clearly? Yes. In fact, I would go as far to say that if that were the case, the aliens, they would have just won the whole war. They would have taken over Earth. And then we wouldn't have even needed that garbage sequel in 2016 at all. Really, it's a shame. I mean, if Priyanka similarly shortened the cable length between her potentiostat and the rotator, she also wouldn't need a sequel of electrochemistry lab research to be able to finish her PhD thesis. PhD thesis, the sequel. More data. Or just like, you know, data at all, since the first one was just complete nonsense. You know, this next time she might even need like a few more tries at it. She might have to do some trial and error, getting the equipment closer. She's going to have to remove a lot of those connection points if possible, maybe get rid of that cart, you know, play with the experimental parameters. I mean, honestly, if you're getting good impedance data, it usually takes the average researcher two or even three times. <laughs> three times? PhD thesis, the trilogy. You saw Priyanka battle the forces of DC voltammetry and the eternal battle between kinetics and mass transport. Now watch her tackle her greatest challenge of all, AC voltammetry. <laughs> Starring Rattlesnake Long Cell Cables and Ekem a la carte coming to a university near you. <laughs> <laughs> Holy moly, where do I get tickets for that show? <laughs> well, stay tuned to the next podcast episode where you can enter for a chance to win. But in the meantime, remember folks, if you're doing EIS tests, get rid of those rattlesnakes and get that cell cable connected as closely as possible to the electrodes. Yeah, exactly. Good impedance data usually needs to have as little impact as possible from noise and interference, or you're just going to have a really bad day in the lab like poor Priyanka did. So with that, thank you everyone for listening and going on this journey with us. And now a word from our sponsors. In three days, the experimental event of the year begins. 
chemistry is dumb. I hate my advisor. Nominated for 10 Oscars, including Best Supporting Electrolyte. Why isn't this working? You're in for the research ride of your life. You just need to reproduce the paper. It was published in Nature! One student's journey through the depths of graduate school research. Oh. I have the wrong units. He will discover how far he's willing to go. This stupid experiment is impossible! Uncover the mystery. <laughs> I'm never going to escape this wretched place. <laughs> The day after tomorrow's group meeting. Rated R. Coming to a theater near you. Advertisement is a joke for comedy purposes and is not real, nor does it constitute an offer of any kind from Pine Research. Restrictions apply. See terms and conditions for details. Not valid in Alaska, Hawaii, any of the contiguous 48 states, or any country on any of the seven earthly continents, except Antarctica. Contact Pine Research for details, real offers, life advice, or product quotes. All right, everybody, we're going to play a very exciting game of electrochemistry abstract Mad Libs. So maybe you played Mad Libs when you were younger. I did. But uh, if you didn't, I'm going to try to explain how Mad Libs work here. So a Mad Lib is a story that has keywords removed from it. So there's like blanks basically that need to be filled in. Now, you ask someone who doesn't know what the story is to fill in the blanks and you ask them each of these things just totally out of context. So they give you, you know, random answers. And hopefully the result is basically this, you know, nonsensical and silly kind of story. So today we're going to play a version of this called Echem Abstract Mad Libs. And what I've done is I've created basically a fake electrochemistry abstract. And I'm going to ask my colleague Alex here for a series of things that are like chemistry or electrochemistry related things like chemicals numbers characterization techniques etc right and he's gonna fill in this abstract for me now alex hasn't heard this abstract before he doesn't know what the context is and really he's just filling in the blanks and then when he's given me all the answers we'll read it all together and hopefully we get a really high impact factor publication out of this are you ready alex i am ready all right perfect so uh, as i said i'm going to start reading some prompts to you and you tell me the first thing that pops into your mind and i'll write it down mm. i need a percent uh 12.5 percent 12.5 percent all right i need an element or a compound cadmium Ooh, cadmium. cadmium you don't see a lot of cadmium i think cadmium is really like isn't it really like toxic i th i think so i think so too yeah well that's gonna make a great paper here. <laughs> it's gonna make I a bet. great paper <laughs> all right uh, another percent um Twelve thousand percent. Oh wow, that's that's more. Twelve thousand percent. Right. That's more than twelve. It is more. That's correct. <laughs> All right, uh, another element or compound. Let's go with. Uh, can I go say diamond? Ooh, I like it. Diamond. Diamond. Very, okay. very, very uh, fancy. All right, fancy. Uh, a number. Any number. Um, three pi. Ooh, three pi. All right. I need three characterization techniques. So just there's like right things that you use to. Well, I'm sort of giving away some of it here, right? But it's a chemistry abstract. Things you use to characterize materials or, or, or things of that nature. I uh, Well, let's do the obvious one, cyclic voltammetry. All right, cyclic voltammetry. Got it. Okay. Let's see. How about uh, optical polarimetry? <laughs> optical polarimetry? What What even is optical polarimetry? It's, it's a thing. <laughs> is it, I, I think you made that up, but uh, that, okay, that's fine. Right, anyway. Mm. Um, let's see. <laughs> How about we do uh, differential scanning pulse tech uh, voltammetry? Differential <laughs> scanning pulse voltammetry. Oh, still, that's, that's just delicious. All right, great. I need two descriptive properties. So uh, stuff that you get from techniques like you just described. Like oh okay. Yeah. You know, like an, so a real example of something like surface area, a property yeah. of a material, right? Okay, okay. Uh so let's go with um uh, let's see what's a good property. How about uh, oh transmittance. Ah transmit is it E N C E or A N C E? I think it's A, -N -C -E. a I spelled it wrong. All right. Uh, and one more. Um and then uh 
Raman cross section. <laughs> Raman cross section. Oh man! So for those who don't know, Alex Raman spectroscopist from graduate school. Yeah. So yeah. this is just. Uh, I have no idea what you're talking about, but I'm glad that you know what it is. <laughs> lots of lots yes. of surface science, Raman. <laughs> yes, exactly. All right, I need three random letters. Three random letters. Mm-hmm. Um, Q, X, W. Q X W. Perfect. All right, I need an animal. An animal. Mm, a pigeon. <laughs> pigeon. Oh, that's man. a good one. Like, oh, yeah, no, I, um, I need a verb that ends in er. Um, runner. Runner. All right. Um, another number. Another number. Wait, was, was runner right? Because runner is a – wait, is runner yeah, yeah. down? Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, verb – yeah, verb ending, you know, you're, that, that is – Okay, That right. should work for, for the for – For the this one. Yeah, okay, yeah. sorry, what was the uh, – Sorry, yeah, a number. A number. Mm-hmm. Another number. Um, I. Ooh, I. Yeah, the imaginary number, square root of I have a feeling one. this is going to make this – <laughs> Absolutely ridiculous, but <laughs> perfect. Um, a gas. A gas. Um, what is it? Hydrogen sulfide? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> hydrogen sulfide. It's a little dangerous. <laughs> yeah, right, 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 dangerous this is imaginary, folks. Just remember, this is imaginary. All right. uh, an amount of time. T- ten months. <laughs> <laughs> I know what this is uh, referring to. This is going to be very good. Okay. Uh, I need I need in any uh, pace that you would like. I need seven different numbers. Seven different numbers. Mm-hmm. Um, forty-two. Forty-two. Next. Five hundred thirty-six. Five hundred thirty-six. Okay. Point five. Point five. That's three. Okay. That's three. Uh, three point one million. <laughs> three point one million. All right. That's four. I need three more. All right. Let's have a maybe. Uh, how about e? <laughs> yeah. All right. E. Go that's e. The, the exponential, right? E, yeah. The exponential. Four, two, three, four. That's five. Okay. I need two more. <laughs> and then, um, log base two of five. <laughs> <laughs> log base two of five. Okay. Uh, and I think we need one. We more. need one more. Two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, two, one more. Um, uh, six. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, just six. Six. Yeah, six. Oh, yeah. Don't no, overthink. No, it. I'm not gonna overthink it. Perfect. So six. All right, and then uh, two more. I guess I need an element or a compound. Okay. Uh, you need two more elements. No, sorry, just one just element one. or compound. Yeah, just yeah. one element or compound. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. Um, how about hydrazine? Ooh, hydrazine. That's a fancy yeah, that's hydrazine. Fancy. And then the last one here, let me – yes, I need some kind of like government uh, agency or department or something like that. Okay, this is going to sound strange. The U.S. Board on Geographic Names. Is that re- – you just made that up. I, I'm pretty sure. I think that's real. U.S. Board on <laughs> Geographic Names. <laughs> Why, why do we have – I don't care. Never mind. I don't care. It's going to make a great abstract. <laughs> okay. Are you ready to read for, – for me to read this abstract? Yes. All right. Go this for is it. the Oxygen Reduction Reaction Publication Ecam Madlib. Here we go. A nanostructured electrocatalyst containing 12.5 weight percent cadmium and 12,000 weight percent diamond <laughs> – <laughs> was prepared via a solvothermal synthesis process and mixed with carbon black in a ratio of 3 pi to 1. <laughs> Physical characterization was performed via cyclic voltammetry, optical polarimetry, and differential scanning pulse voltammetry. Those are not physical characterization techniques. <laughs> but okay. <laughs> to measure the electrocatalyst nanostructure, the transmittance pore size, and Raman cross-section. <laughs> this, is, this is brilliant stuff. Brilliant yes. stuff. ORR activity was measured using a QXW electrode rotator <laughs> <laughs> and a pigeon runner EIS potentiostat <laughs> from Pine Research. <laughs> That's our next model, everybody, is next the pigeon one. runner. That's right. We go from wave driver to pigeon runner. Pigeon runner. <laughs> the electrolyte used <laughs> the electrolyte used was I molar sulfuric acid. <laughs> what 
even is that? It's a physical impossibility is what it is. <laughs> and Solution was saturated. Oh, boy. Here we go. Oh Sa- solution was saturated with hydrogen sulfide for 10 months prior <laughs> to electrochemical tests. <laughs> That's a bit excessive, but that's it's a okay. Excessive. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, for ten months. Yeah. Oh wow. LSV and EIS measurements were performed. Linear sweep voltammograms were collected between. Uh, here we go. Forty-two volts and five hundred thirty-six volts at a scan rate of. Oh, uh, this one makes sense. 0. 0.5 millivolts per second. Uh, see, every so often there's one that actually like. You know, might be real. Okay. That experiment's gonna yeah. take forever. It sure will. Okay. Oh, actually, this next one makes sense too. Which is what? Uh, I know. Okay. And impedance measurements were performed potentiostatically between three point one million hertz. See, that's that's a, a wow, value actually, you can do. And like... e hertz. I mean, that's literally like three megahertz to like almost a hertz. Huh. I'm sorely disappointed <laughs> in you. <laughs> you have designed an actual EIS experiment <laughs> that could happen. Can't I'm, get the Raman cross section I'm, from that. I'm very disappointed. <laughs> yes, with an amplitude of uh, log base two of five millivolts, which is some number, and I should probably know that faster than I do. But I, I don't. I, yeah, that's like two or something. Oh, I, I straight up just made that up. Oh yeah, wow. no, that's a number. Okay, that's a great. Number, yeah, it was discovered that six times better activity. Okay, mm-hmm. towards oxygen reduction was achieved on our novel electrocatalyst than on plain hydrazine <laughs> signaling that a new benchmark should be set by the u.s board on geographic names for all future research <laughs> you know i think the u.s board of geographic names needs to get out of the electrochemistry business immediately because i'm just worried about safety and health of bubbling hydro- hydrogen sulfide for 10 months but maybe maybe the board should get involved because how many ridiculous names do we have in electrochemistry? That's true. For maybe think so. Maybe maybe yeah, we actually need someone to, to set the standards on naming conventions. Oh man, yeah, I guess so. I mean, well, who's setting the naming conventions for our company with the pigeon runner potential stat? I mean, I think I think we need some more oversight desperately. So yeah, I think I think it's that we need more and not less oversight in all of our companies and government agencies when it comes to hydrazine catalysts and cadmium (laughs) diamond Raman cross-section catalysts, all kinds of things. Well, anyway, I hope that was uh, extremely educational and fun for everybody. Um, And uh, yeah, well. That's a, that's a, uh, what is that? That's a nature letters, right? Yeah. yeah. Nature letters. Or nano, nano materials, I guess. Is is 12,000% diamond still nano? Is that, or is that just way too much diamond? (laughs) Oh man. Published in the Journal of the Electrochemical Society. (laughs) Yeah. Which is a very respectable journal. We're not saying anything here, but uh, yeah, I don't know. (laughs) I think, uh, I think nano letters, I hope they come calling because this is, I need to elevate my, my H index here. Right. (laughs) Well, I hope you all enjoyed this very much and uh, yeah, we'll see y'all next time.